the time has come to take our first steps into a much larger world. To quote Obi-Wan Kenobi, we are going to move now into inferential statistics, which is going to be the back half of this course. And quite frankly, if you were going to go on in statistics would be all you would be doing pretty much in statistics, because inferential statistics is a very, very, very big deal. So in order to, to make those steps into inferential statistics, we need to pause a little bit and think about some of the definitions that we've learned along the way and how they're going to help us make these leaps that we need to make in these chapters. So first of all, just a reminder that a statistic is a descriptive measure of a sample and a parameter is a descriptive measure of a population. Usually when we're talking about them in this course, we're talking about those in numerical form. For example, the average body temperature from a sample would be X bar, that's a statistic, but the average body temperature for all people on the planet, that would be mu, that's a population value and that's a parameter. Now, inferential statistics is what we call the methodology of taking that sample and applying it to that larger group, right? So you take a sample because, quite frankly, you don't usually have access to an entire population with the exception, hypothetically speaking, of probability distributions. You don't really know what the whole population is like. It's unknown to you. It exists, but you just don't know what it is. So you take a sample and figure out stuff about that sample and then you'll say I think the population works more or less like this sample. That's the whole idea behind inferential statistics in a nutshell. But of course when you do that, when you take a sample and use it to estimate a parameter, it's not going to be perfect. That's why you have something called sampling error. Sampling error means that hey my sample is not perfect, therefore my statistic will not be perfect. It can't be, it's impossible. Inherently, because you're not looking at the entire population in, the, in your sample, then your statistic will never be a perfect estimator of your parameter, but it should be close. Um, in general, of course, what do we want from our samples? We want our samples to be random and unbiased. If they're not that, we are in big trouble. And of course, in real life, it is actually quite tricky in some instances to get a random unbiased sample, but that's hypothetically speaking what you want. And then if you have the random and unbiased, then you also want the bigger the sample, the, the better it is for you, right? The larger samples is a good thing, right? You would rather have a sample, say, of 1,000 people than a sample of 200 people, right? Not that 200 is necessarily bad, it's just that the bigger would be better in this instance as long as it's a random unbiased sample. All right, and then in chapter three, we also saw this little um, table about those concepts that we were just talking about, which is that a population has a parameter value. Remember mu, you've seen mu before, or sigma, sigma is a parameter, right? It's a measurement of all the individuals in the whole population. And usually you don't know what it is because you can't get all the, all the individuals in your population to answer, say like in a census. So um, it's some constant number, you just don't know what it is. So what you do is you go get a sample, which is a subset of that population, measure that sample and get a statistic out of it. That you'll know, you'll get your sample and you'll know what your statistic is. And then it varies from sample to sample to sample. So if you do a sample today of a thousand people, that'll be slightly different than the sample the next day of a thousand people. So it'll vary from sample to sample, but you'll get to know what it actually is. And then you assume that this parameter value is close to the statistic value, as long as you took a nice random unbiased sample. All right, so let's move away from big ideas for just a second and think about pumpkins. So suppose you want to estimate the population mean price for pumpkins from all 50 states. So you want to know the average price for pumpkins across all 50 states. It's close to Halloween. Who knows? So here we have the mean price per state for pumpkins from a sale of, or from a sample of five states in cents per pound. Okay, so there are the five states. There is the price in, I should say, price in um, cents per pound. Now the first question they ask us is, what is the sample? State the sample. Well, the sample would be these five states, right? So the five states chosen, that's the sample. The population would be all 50 states. I wonder what the price of pumpkins is in Hawaii. I don't think they grow pumpkins in Hawaii. It'd probably be pretty high. 
All right, so now I want to find the sample mean price per pound. Well, we've done this since chapter three. So you go to stat, you go to edit, you clear out the old, but I actually already did this and typed in my new number. So there they are. Then I go to stat, calculate one variable, no frequency list this time. This is not a weighted mean and it's right there, 21.4. So it's 21.4 cents per pound. All right, now what is the parameter of interest and do we know its value? Well, the parameter would be the average price per pound in all 50 states. And keep in mind that's a mu, right? Average price per pound, that's a mu value, right? For all the pumpkins in all 50 states. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna put the mu part at the back just to remind you guys that this is a mu. We don't know what its value is, but we do hope that it's close to X bar. Um, as long as our sample was random and biased, unbiased. As long as our sample was random and unbiased, this should be the case. Oh, but we'll take a moment and look at our sample. Was our sample truly random and unbiased? Hmm. Well, our sample included the states Indiana, Michigan, New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, which if you know anything about the geography of the US, that means they're all kind of in the same region, more or less. Um, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio um, are all Midwest states that border each other, and Ohio borders Pennsylvania, and, and New York borders Pennsylvania. So they're kind of in a string. So they're not actually spread out across all the country which is probably not a good idea, right? So this appears to be kind of a biased sample. Um, sample appears to be biased because it only includes the Midwest and the Northeast and actually states that are close, quite close together. And the states are relatively close together. They all touch each other in one string, right? So this sample appears to be biased. And once you have a biased sample, you're in trouble because that means that all the numbers you created from it, like the mean and the X bar and all that stuff, they all are dodgy, right? So you've got to be careful. We would probably toss them out and say, this is probably not a good, um, param or, excuse me, a good estimator of the parameter. The parameter is probably not close to 21.4 sets per pound. There, I think I wrote that a little bit better. Because the sample was biased, the parameter is probably not close to 21.4 cents per pound. Once you have a biased sample, basically you gotta check the numbers. They're no good to you once your sample is biased.